Kalani Satake is ready to lead BYU football into the Big 12 era. He talks about it on today's show. You are Locked On Cougars, your daily podcast on the BYU Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, everybody? I'm Jay Catch, your host here on Locked On Cougars, your resident BYU insider. Thank you for making Locked On Cougars your first listen today. Thank you for being everydayers with us here on the Locked On Podcast Network. We are your original daily podcast focused on all things BYU sports. So big thank you to all of you once again for making it a part of your day, no matter if you're listening to it on the first thing you wake up or if you're watching it uh, at night, no matter when you listen to it, thank you for checking it out and supporting my work. All right, let's dive right in on today's show. Had a great opportunity Monday afternoon to catch up with BYU head coach Kalani Sitake. Obviously, he is going to be the man that ultimately everything is going to kind of fall upon as BYU enters the Big 12 Conference. Cougars stumble out of the gate. People are going to blame Kalani. Cougars absolutely rock it out of the gate. Guess what? Kalani's going to get the praise. He understands what he's up against because this is a guy, as he is fond of saying, grew up a BYU fan, had the uh, good fortune to be able to play for one of the legends of the game in Lavelle Edwards, the guy he has always wanted to emulate at BYU. And I'm going to echo something that PK, my compatriot Patrick Kinahan, over on the KSL Sports Zone says uh, often, I uh, actually said it just yesterday uh, on our radio show, that Kalani Sitake is the closest thing to BYU has had to Lavelle Edwards than the original item. And Kalani learned at the foot of Lavelle Edwards. Lavelle was a mentor of his when he first got the job at BYU before Lavelle passed. Obviously playing for him and obviously I'm sure talking to him throughout his coaching career leading up to becoming the head coach at BYU. A lot of that has been a big deal for Kalani Sitake and now he is the guy that ha- has been tasked with leading BYU into a brand new era. They are going to be members of the Big 12 Conference officially two days from now. Saturday, July 1st, it becomes officially official. BYU is going to be a Big 12 member. Looking forward to all that, but I had a great opportunity Monday afternoon to catch up with BYU's head coach and talk a little bit about what's going on as he gets ready for the, his debut alongside his program in the Big 12 Conference. But let me just uh, say one thing. Uh, there was a question asked by Kevin Reynolds from the Salt Lake Tribune. There's actually two questions right out of the gate that I think uh, coincide with a lot of what I wanted to discuss. And it's actually a little bit of an insight. BYU, as many of you might recall, in 2016 made really big overtures to the uh, to the Big 12 at that time. The Big 12 had said they were looking at expansion. BYU was called down to Dallas to meet with the Big 12 brass. University presidents, uh, guys like Bob Bowlesby, who was the commissioner at the time, they made a big old presentation of that. Guys like Tom Homer in attendance, as well as Kalani Sitake. And the question was asked by Kevin right out of the gate of today's interview about that meeting with the Big 12 in 2016 and how, in some ways, it laid the groundwork for what BYU is about to celebrate two days from now. So here you go. Without further ado, BYU head coach, Kalani Sitake. You were a part of the 2016 team that went down to Dallas the first time, right? Mm-hmm. The 12. I was wondering if you could kind of walk me through what you remember about that and kind of this journey that you've been on. Oh, yeah, when we went down for the presentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was pretty cool because it was like the um, we all had our parts and we were going to kind of like pitch the school and it, it felt like, okay, when we're on the, on the flight down, we're kind of mm-hmm. divvying out who's going to say what and what we're going to hit with and the timing of it all. And it was kind of cool just to think that Wow, this is this could have happened, you know. And and, and uh, went through the meetings, and it's nice to see all of them. But more than anything, it was it was the the best experience for me about it was that I was able to talk about our school and kind of brag about it, you know, and and, and tell them why it's so unique and different and why it's a a valuable partner. And so it's, it's nice that now we're here, we are, you know, years later, um, going into this season. It's like. It all comes full circle, and and, and uh, not only did I say that when I presented to them, but now I've been head coach for seven years, going to my eighth year, mm-hmm. and I I totally believe what I what I told him. So it's a it's a it's a cool feeling. Do you remember in that moment of it makes it more powerful having you were a player here, and mm-hmm. kind of grew up a BYU fan, like that's the guy making the pitch to the Big Twelve. Like yeah. do you think that resonates more than just maybe another coach who has no relationship to the school yeah and, and I, I mean yeah I think I think for me it was really cool that I was able to speak as a fan mm-hmm. and then speak as a, as a former player for Lavelle Edwards 
and it's like the um yeah it was it was really cool and i, I felt su such a, a cre incredible amount of honor just like oh my gosh i get to do this you know this is like i'm not even been a coach long a head coach and and this is really cool and and um but you also know that that uh, lavelle edwards is loved by so many people yeah. uh in 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 sports and just all around the, the country you know and so that wasn't even in they knew who he was, and, but it was cool for me to brag about it. And then as a fan, just kind of like, this is how we're so good at this and everything. And and you go through the the, the tradition that's been here. It's, it was it was a that was a really cool experience. <clears throat> now, you as a head coach, you have the player perspective on this. How would you, have, as a player, would have reacted to the fact that hey, we're playing at the highest level of football? Yeah, that's. I mean, I, I I don't know how I could have thought about it, but I that would have been really cool, yeah. you know. And, and uh, the experiences that you get, to just go to different places and to have that, like you know that 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 P five level, just mm -hmm. the these these um, these programs that have so much history and tradition behind it, and places that you've always seen is like it's kind of like those things that you just uh, you just don't think about it. But now as a player, I think the guys have this high level of appreciation. And I, whenever players are, are showing gratitude, usually good things happen from it. So I'm going to keep building off of it and, and then just keep uh, hoping that they, you know, they, they keep showing the appreciation and gratitude because that's where you can really grow and get better and, and get a lot of things accomplished. You, let, you talk about the groundwork being laid in 2016, but you've been working officially about two years now, getting ready for what's going to happen officially on Saturday. How big mm -hmm. of a deal is that in your mind? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, for, for us was just uh, keep promoting the brand and, and, and um, show why BYU is a, a, a valuable partner. And it's not just the wins. I know everybody's like, well, BYU wins and they do that. But it's we have this incredible fan base that I keep talking about. That's it, The fan base has always been big time. And, and, and I know that we've been independent. We've been in other conferences. And now we're going to a big time conference. The fans always been big time. There's, there's nothing small about our fan base we we and it's in every sport and so um that's a great place to start with with our fans being the key and i can't wait i mean when even when we're, we're we knew we're going into the big 12 we played at baylor and our fans were all there yeah you can you could see pictures and video and footage of us being in different places and our fans show up and and um yeah I, i'm really proud of our team and our and our program and, and the uh the department i'm so i'm so freaking proud of the fans i mean they're the ones that really have been waiting for this and they're the ones that deserve this more than anybody they, they deserve this opportunity to go big time because they've been big time and now this just really confirms it you've brought in 20 some odd players via the transfer portal how do you mm -hmm. feel by and large they've essentially assimilated into the program yeah we feel great about our team our players that are currently on the roster yeah. but whenever there's a chance to get better and create more competition and add depth and we're going to do that and and i think uh giving the power to um jay hill and kelly papinga and a rod on offense defense and special teams uh to make those decisions i think it's important i support them but i also see what they're seeing you know and and, and uh, we we love our players that we have on our team but there's there's always ways to improve one way is to get more talent in there to compete so when they when you compete you get competition brewing um, it just gets the best out of everybody, and so, but it also allows you to have great depth, you know. And so when we we get that accomplished, um, good things happen. But also the the camaraderie and the brotherhood that, that joins you when you're competing at a high level, it, it's something special. And we've already seen it from Keaton as as our quarterback, yeah. and how he's embraced this program, embraced the, the 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 culture and the community, and what he gets to represent. I mean, he's all in, you know, and and and. Um, when he does that, you see that quarterback room. They're really close, and that's because of, of uh, A. Rod allowing the competition to to take place, but also uh, managing it with good people. When you have competition, great talent with really great people, uh, good things will happen. And so I, uh, I'm predicting that we're going to be in a really good spot. We'll just see what happens when we get to the games. You may have already answered this, but I wanted to ask you about Keaton in particular. Has he been everything you expected him to be coming into the program? Yeah, and that's kind of hard when you when you haven't played a down for yeah. us yet, you know. But uh, when you're looking at what he's able to accomplish already, we already know he's played a lot of football, so we know there's that experience. There's not like, there's not this wonder how he's going to answer to a live ball game. Yeah. 
He's been in hostile environments, including our own, you know. So he's been in places before that, that, that are tough to play in. He's been through tough situations. Um, I think for us now is build our offense around his skill and his talents and his strengths and then uh, allow him to just be a, be a, a playmaker and a ball player. That's, uh, but, but also letting him know that he doesn't have to do it alone. And I think A-Rod's a master at that stuff. He, can, he knows how to utilize the right quarterbacks and get the scheme right. He did it with, with Zach. He did, he did it with Jaron. Mm -hmm. And he's going to do it again with Keaton. And I, I feel really good about what, we, what he can accomplish on our offense. Has Jay been everything you expect him to be as your defensive coordinator? Of course. I've known Jay forever, man. I know. That's, that's a good friend of mine. And um, it's different. It's, it's not like uh, I taught Jay anything. We were we actually learned together. Mm -hmm. You know, so we, 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 we learned uh, the same style of defense, the same style of recruiting, the same development patterns, all that stuff. He speaks the same language as I do. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it wasn't like a, a teacher-mentor type of uh, a mentor-pupil type of relationship. We grew together in this profession. In fact, he could probably teach me a lot more as being the head coach and than, than what I've done. So uh, we're, we're, we've grown together in, in the, the profession. I'm just glad he's with me. You know, he's a huge asset and um, he'll be such a great addition for us. Uh, I've already seen the, 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 the benefits of it. I've seen some positive things from our players on our defense and our team overall. And he has this, this is great positive attitude and man, I've missed him. I worked with him for a decade, and I'm glad to have him back. How much like pleading, prodding? How much did you have to do to convince him to, to pull the trigger? No, I mean it's just talking. It was just <laughs> like, okay, this is, it's, it's like, let's share the same vision yeah. of what we can accomplish, and 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 also um, let's include everything involved in, in, in the decision making process yeah. from wh wherever. When, for him to know exactly what this is, he needs to know the decisions that he gets to make. Mm -hmm. The the, the how much power he has in our program, but also how much ownership, and then also the people that he gets to work with. I think that was really key for him. And and as we made this decision to, to shift this way to defense, uh, I think he's been able to, to, to embrace the players that are on our roster on defense, and he's done an amazing job leading the players on the defense, but also leading the staff that he has on defense. It's been amazing. You've acknowledged this in the past, but how big has the administration, Tom, et cetera, been for you guys making this transition to the Power oh, 5 level? I love Tom. I love what Tom Homo has done for this program, for this university. I don't think, um, I hope people respect it and understand how how how, he, how much he's worked, how, how hard he's worked to get here, get this program here. And so you can see a, a tremendous amount of pride and excitement from him. But yeah, he, he, his vision, and the way that he's able to work with his staff, with everyone involved, I mean, with, with when you're looking at his staff and the, the administration, the athletic department, they've been amazing. And, and uh, he's never stopped working. And so now that we're getting to the Big 12 this week, he's not going to stop working. The guy just works all the time. And I'm lucky that he's my AD. How has it been just with associating with these new coaches and other administrators in the Big 12 so far? I know you haven't been to media day or anything like that, mm -hmm. but how's it been in, in the limited interactions you may have had so I've far? I've been around them. But we've okay. had meetings in, 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 in uh, Arizona, okay. Big 12 meetings and things yeah. like that. So, and we did that last year. We did it this year. I've, I've been at, uh, um, you know, at, at uh, coaches' events around yeah. them. So you know, we, Lavelle started a coaches classic that I was a part of in, at Pebble Beach, so I did that. I mean, my golf game's not great there, but... It was cool that I played these these holes on Tiger Woods, you know. Sure, yeah, right absolutely. Out here, uh, duffing shots on the same hole that Tiger Woods got birdies and eagles on. Anyways, um, but in these in these events, whether it's a Nike event or a Pebble Beach event or whatever it is, I get to mingle and hang out with the coaches and in in, in these uh, meetings that we've had, Big 12 meetings in Arizona have been really cool, just to hear them. We we've had we've spent time yeah. talking about different things in college football and in the conference and. Uh, I'm just I'm just really happy to be part of that group and uh, great coaches, great men. And you hear them and just they have this passion and this love for their team and their players. And uh, we can all agree on that that that's a that's where we begin. And, and as a coach, that's why we got into the business. But I've been I've been really impressed with all the coaches in the conference.
There you go, BYU head coach Kalani Sitake uh, talking with myself. And as I mentioned, the opening two questions by Kevin Reynolds. But great stuff all the same. You can tell he's excited to have the guys around him who are going to be around him leading BYU into this Big 12 era. Obviously, Jay Hill coming in and him talking about the fact that he wanted to essentially align his ideas for his defense alongside uh, Jay Hill's and work together. I think both of them working in tandem with one another, as he mentioned, they grew up together in the business. They're going to work very very well together and I cannot wait to see the fruits of their labor together now is it going to come off right away no I don't think so I think it's going to take some time for BYU to experience the success on defense they believe that they can have but uh, I'm not going to count anything out these two guys are very very bright minds when it comes to defense in particular I've got no doubt that they will do their absolute darndest to make sure that BYU is in the best spot they possibly can be as they compete in the Big 12 it's a massive Massive undertaking, but you can tell Kalani is confident, he's ready, and he's just eager to have it here finally. It's been the better part of two years officially that BYU has been officially, uh, unofficially officially a member of the Big 12 Conference, but the groundwork's been being laid since way back in 2011 when BYU made the announcement they were going independent. They had every goal, every... Uh, thing that they did in independence was that the the end goal was to make it to the power five level and now they're literally just days away from celebrating that and like i said 65 days away from today officially kicking off their big 12 era in football we're under that we're just over a month away i think from byu soccer officially beginning the big 12 era in their own right with the first sport uh, to start that out but very much looking forward to it and a huge huge thank you to kalani satake for joining us here on the podcast. All right, coming up here in just a minute, the worst kept secret in BYU uh, when it comes to the transfer portal additions, a guy that I've talked about multiple times on this podcast. We're going to talk about a guy named Simi Moala coming up next right here on Locked on Cougars. First, a word on our friends over at FanDuel. They've been working with us for quite a while now. And the best part about FanDuel is, folks, is they want to help you guys out. Baseball season is in full swing. They want nothing more than to help you guys have some fun in the sports gambling uh, industry if you want to do that. Take your first swing at batting, MLB, at betting on the MLB with FanDuel and get 10 times your first amount in bonus bets up to $200 back, my friends. That's right. Just bet, tw- bet 20 bucks and you'll land $200 back in bonus bets, win or lose. That's $200 you can spend on everything from money line to over under who do you think is going to be the first home run in any given game all on an app that's safe secure and super easy to use plus you can when you win you can get paid out instantly it's my favorite feature of FanDuel is the fact you can get paid out instantly no having to hit a, hit a reserve amount of money before you can cash out they'll pay you out whatever you win as soon as you want it paid out there's no better place to bet on the MLB than with our friends at FanDuel America's number one sports book so sign up today and visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get up that 200 200- $200, excuse me, in bonus bets back. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more now. That's FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars a part of your day. Thank you for being everydayers with us here on the podcast. All right, time now to talk a little bit more about Simi Moala. Now, I've been alluding to this, reporting it, saying that, hey, I would anticipate that Simi Moala is going to be a member of the BYU football program. He went on Ben Criddle's show on ESPN 960, good friends of the podcast. I love Ben. I actually worked with him back in the day. I was his original producer, funny enough, for Cougar Sports 960. It's a, been over a decade since I uh, helped start that show, but he's done great things with it, and he has Simi Moala in studio talking with him about his decision to attend BYU. So it's, it's officially unofficially official. I don't know what you want to term it, but Simon Moala said he's going to enroll at BYU and play this fall. It's officially on the record that it's going to happen. It's been unofficial. I've been hearing from multiple people, hey, keep an eye on Simon Moala. He's going to play for BYU. Okay, great. When the official announcement comes from BYU, I'll be happy to do that. And we are still officially waiting word from BYU on that. Could that be grades? Could that be making sure there's eligibility in order with the NCAA? There's a myriad of different things that need to be uh, checked off the checklist, so to say, to make sure that Simon Moala is squared away when it comes to playing for BYU, but anticipate Simi Mawala playing for BYU. Now, I was waiting to talk about this until the word kind of officially got out uh, about one uh, crucial piece of information. And it's not really crucial, I guess, but uh, I've had enough conversations with folks. And people, when I've talked about Simi Mawala, have hopped in my mentions uh, uh, on social media, have mentioned in our YouTube comments as well, saying, Jake, Simi Mawala has been sitting out for an entire year. How, how good can he truthfully be? What can he ultimately offer to BYU that they don't have on the roster right now? And frankly, I, I don't necessarily think you're wrong in having that thought about Simi Mawala joining the BYU football program. But as I have said previously when we've talked about this topic, you can do a lot worse than bringing in a former all-conference Pac-12 lineman like Mawala. 
This is a guy who has got elite size for his position. He'll probably play offensive tackle, and I think he'll come in and compete for playing time right away. Will he push a guy like a Caleb Etienne for starting reps at right tackle? Because I think that Kingsley Suomatia, it would take a Herculean effort uh, to unseat a guy like that at left tackle. But could Simi Mawala come in and establish himself as BYU starting right tackle? I'm not counting out of the realm of possibility. He's all a six foot seven, 300 plus pounds, and if he's in shape, that's the biggest thing. Also, he's been spending a year out of football. Is he in playing shape right now? Is he ready to step in and immediately compete for playing time? That's all going to be determined should A, he get enrolled in school, and obviously B, be available once BYU hits the field in early August for training camp. But there's no reason to think that bringing in Simi Mawala is a negative for BYU. This is a guy who is invested in football. He told Ben Criddle, I took a year off to work on myself, and I still uh, am in love with the game. I don't want to get back to it. That's the type of thing you want to have. Uh, easily could guys can step away from the game and say, you know what, the grind just isn't worth it for me. There's other news yesterday. I reported on Twitter that former BYU running back Sione Finau, who has not played in, I think, at least one season, maybe two seasons, is going to enroll at Utah State. He uh, posted on Instagram, my new home, and tagged USU football in it. So uh, a guy like Sione Finau, who way back in 2019, as a freshman for BYU, was the Cougars' leading rusher. Obviously, Tyler Algier, during the 2020 and 2021, one campaigns really became the star for BYU running back and that rendered a guy like uh, Sione Fina to a backup role and now all these years later he's officially going to enroll at Utah State but hasn't played in over a year. It's going to be a similar circumstance, I think, for a guy like Finau like it is for Simi Mawala. I, I believe both of them, the one thing you can count on is the fact that they sat out of football for some time and easily could have said, you know what? I, I'm good. I, they could have just said, uh, the grind isn't worth it anymore. I'm going to move on with life and do something different. The love of the game at, at some level has drawn them back into playing college football, and you can do something with that. Guys that are invested, that want to put the time in, you can work with that. It may take Samuel Mawala maybe this season to get himself back into fighting shape, quote-unquote, and be ready to contribute for BYU, but here's the thing. Like I said, he is an all former all-conference lineman. He has got the genes. He's got the God-given talents to be a star player for BYU along that offensive front. I, I, I see zero, I mean zero downside to bringing him in. So I'm looking forward to seeing him ultimately enroll at BYU, see how things work out, and wish him nothing but the best as he continues to make sure all his uh, T's are crossed and I's are dotted when it comes to his eligibility and getting enrolled at BYU. But should all that transpire, and he he's officially a Official, a member of the BYU football program come August when BYU kicks off training camp. Hey, great. That makes it, I think, a good 10 deep for BYU on that offensive line of guys who I think have a shout or at least the ability to be starting caliber offensive linemen. It's an awesome uh, problem for a guy like Daryl Funk to work with. Iron is absolutely going to sharpen iron. This could truthfully, and I'm dead serious about this take. I've talked about it in the past on this podcast about different offensive lines I think are some of the deepest, most talented in BYU history. This 2023 offensive line on paper may be literally the deepest and the most talented BYU's ever had. And I, I, I'm, 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 I'm reticent to say that because they could obviously upgrade themselves. And obviously, we talked about this going into last season, how we felt the offensive line was going to be a better unit than we most of us probably thought. And they didn't really live up to expectations in the run game. They lived up to it in the pass protection realm. But... The, the depth and the, just the, the accolades that this offensive line coming in for BYU has, I'd be hard-pressed to find a better offensive line in their program's history than this one. Maybe some of, them, some of them in the 90s, some in the 80s would have a shout, but in terms of the overall ability to potentially go 10 deep at minimum that have either started games in their college career or are guys that I think talent-wise are future starters or if not already starters, it's hard pressed to find a better unit than this. And I think Simu Mawala absolutely adds to that list. So tip of the cap to Ben Criddle for getting the scoop on everybody and actually getting Simu Mawala on the record and looking forward to him ultimately getting enrolled in school and hopefully competing for BYU once they hit the field in August. All right, we will uh, to wrap up today's show with a look back at the regular season finale in 2018 for BYU football. Maybe Zach Wilson's finest performance, but we, we will find out later that it was not his finest performance of the season, but it came in a loss, and we'll talk about that as we continue on right here on Locked on Cougars. 
Thank you once again for making Lockdown Cougars a part of your routine, my friends. Now, uh, we're wrapping up the 2018 season here with a look back. He's gone through all 155 games in BYU football history. And Zach Wilson, obviously, was trending upward. We talked about it for those of you who are everydayers on yesterday's podcast, how he posted really solid performances, not perfect performances, but solid performances that indicated he was starting to really grasp what BYU was running in wins over UMass as well as New Mexico State. Well, BYU officially had reached bowl eligibility with that win over New Mexico State and obviously was going to wait to find out where they would play in the postseason. But for the only time in independence, uh, BYU finished up the regular season with a road game at Utah. It was due to a quirk in the Pac-12 schedule that allowed BYU and Utah to play this game on Thanksgiving weekend. And BYU came out of the gate absolutely flying. Remember, Utah in this game, BYU came into it 6-5. and five. So not necessarily an elite season, but a solid season. A bounce back year, obviously, after the 4-9 debacle of 2017. But Utah, on the other hand, wow. 9-2, and two, ranked 17th in the country coming into this one. Had everything to play for, it felt like, in so many ways. But BYU and Zach Wilson took it to Utah early on in this one. Obviously, the storyline going in, it's Zach Wilson playing as a true freshman against the squad he grew up rooting for. The picture of him with Kyle Whittingham as a youngster in uh, youth football camps at Utah was featured prominently in the pregame uh, talk. And here's the thing about this. He went out, along with the rest of BYU, and absolutely took it to Utah. They actually led 20 to nothing if you were a will recall uh midway at excuse me at halftime of this game got up 28 to 7 and then utah <laughs> i will never forget comes storming back 28 points in the final 16 minutes to just absolutely stun BYU and get out of there with a 35 to 27 win. Excuse me, I, I misspoke. Utah was uh, eight and three coming into this game, ranked 17th in the country. Jason Shelley rallied Utah, ended up with 141 yards passing as well as uh, 61 yards rushing, so just over 200 yards total yards, two touchdowns, and, and he led a massive comeback. Armand Shine ran for two touchdowns for Utah uh, to get them the rally late in this game. If you recall, Jason Shelley had that touchdown run. If I call was the was the capping uh, touchdown for Utah in their comeback attempt and it just it was it was just it was a man it was a game you look at it. Zach Wilson maybe had his finest performance of the season to date in this game 20 of 29 for 204 yards two touchdowns one interception also led BYU in rushing with 14 carries for 73 yards uh, Matt Hadley had two rushing touchdowns he was second on the team in rushing with 64 yards but uh, Matt Bushman had 92 yards receiving and a touchdown it just BYU was rolling in this game and they felt like and I, this is my personal take on this it felt like BYU went into prevent mode on offense they were like you know what we're gonna run the ball we're gonna assault this game away they learned their lesson at some point, you'd hope at some point, to never, never take your foot off the accelerator when it comes to facing off against Kyle Winningham in Utah. You give the Utes an inch, they will take a mile. And that's exactly what Utah did. They came storming back, as I said, 28 unanswered points to stun BYU 35-27. to And uh, There are a lot of the games in that run that BYU lost, the, te- the nine straight games they lost to Utah over that decade. They were unable to get over the top against their top rivals. But this one is one of the ones that stings the absolute most because you had no business, and I'm serious about this, they had no business losing that game in particular because you storm out to a 20 nothing lead at halftime. You're up 28 to seven, uh, excuse me, 27 to seven at one point in this game. How in the world do you take your foot off the accelerator thinking, you know what, we're good? Utah had literally uh, everything to to play for, pride, et cetera. I know it didn't count for them when in terms of the Pac-12 standings, but it's a rivalry game. You could not afford to take your foot off the accelerator. And what did BYU do in this game? It's exactly what they did. They tried to just go, we're going to go run mode. We're going we're gonna to salt this game away. And they paid the ultimate price by losing a game, in my opinion, they really didn't have much business losing. But uh, Utah gets the win and it drops BYU to 6-6. And and we would find out after this game, obviously, as bowl games were announced, that BYU is going to make the trip to Boise, Idaho to play in the famous Idaho Potato Bowl. They face off against Western Michigan. And we will talk about the best performance of Zach Wilson's young career coming up on tomorrow's show because it was a good one. And I actually got a really funny story about where I watched that performance for Zach Wilson from. We'll talk about that on tomorrow tomorrow's podcast. All right, so there you go. Uh, that's everything you guys need to know about I, that I can think of on a Thursday. Uh, tomorrow, I decided to push the mailbag to a Friday. So if you got questions, send them in now via email, lockedonbyu at gmail.com. Drop us a DM on Twitter, Locked On Cougars, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. You can search out there and drop us a note there. Uh, my personal Twitter feed is Jacob C. Hatch. You can DM me or just uh, send me a tweet. Let me know what your questions are, and we'll get to as many of them, if not all of them, that come in on tomorrow's edition of the podcast. So thank you once again for making 
making Locked On Cougars your first listen today. They cannot thank you guys enough for your support of the podcast, as always. Until tomorrow, about, also, thank you to all of you who are everydayers, and thank you to all of you who have submitted entries for our giveaway coming up later this summer. If you want to do that, once again, also lock, lockedonbyu at gmail.com is the email address. So once again, until tomorrow, have a great rest of your day, my friends. This has been the Locked On Cougars podcast. See ya.